Hello everyone. If I could have your attention please, we're going to get started this afternoon. Um, my name is Chuck and I'd like to welcome all of you to the Archives and History Library for the Block Series Lecture today. Uh, before we start, I believe everyone in this room probably owns one of these or one similar. Please make sure they're off or silenced. We don't want to interrupt Mr. Hicks during his lecture. Um, before I turn the floor over to Anthony, and Anthony, this mic is very hot. Uh, before I turn the mic over to Anthony, uh, I'd like to make an announcement about an upcoming lecture. On uh, September 28th, starting at 10 o'clock, we are going to host a Civil War, West Virginia in the Civil War Symposium. We will have a number of speakers in for this. Uh, Richard Armstrong, Hunter Lesser, Dr. Catherine Antolini, and Terry Lowry will all be speaking on various topics. In, the, in between the, the speeches, uh, Rick Wolf and um, Steve Cunningham will both have material here, artifacts, Civil War artifacts. Rick Wolf actually will be presenting one of his photograph exhibits that he's won numerous awards nationwide with. Uh, every author will have books for sale and they will all be happy to sign them for you if you purchase. And once again, that is September 28th and it will start at 10 o'clock that morning and run throughout the entire day. Uh, I'm going to now turn the floor over to Mr. Kinzer here. And once again, thank you all for coming. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I certainly appreciate you guys coming out. It's a wonderful day to be here and to be a part of our block speaker series. I want to make the announcement out, out front that uh, our August block speaker series is being canceled at the moment. We're looking to September for our next speaker, which will be announced uh, as we put it together. I want to also thank the uh, Division of uh, Arts and Culture for allowing us to put on the block speaker series with the Archives and History uh, staff. They've done a wonderful job over the last five years that the block speaker series has been being put on. Our guests have been phenomenal, and our guest today is just as fantastic. <clears throat> Our organization, the West Virginia Center for African American Art and Culture, have uh, put this series on the last five years. We want to thank the audience for being a part of our lecture series over the number of years and your continual support of our organization. During the last several years, our guests have been wonderfully experienced and knowledgeable about the history of the area. And that is what we want to put together to a younger generation and younger audience, that our community, our neighbors, outside of your parents, can help guide you and instruct you on how to continually be a positive person in your community. So lean on those community individuals and reach out to them gain their assistance and their knowledge about life and uh, work and school skills. <clears throat> I want to play a piece of uh, history that was done f five years ago, and then I'll introduce our guests. The excerpt I'm going to play was done by West Virginia Radio, and the reporter was Roxy Todd. Elliot Hicks, an African American who grew up in the west side of Charleston, says all of these stories of his community should be remembered and talked about. And Charleston was an enabling community, and I got to see when black people owned businesses here at that time. We need to see how we can succeed by looking back at history, we need to see what we can use from that to move forward, and so and, and knowing history is awfully important. The once diverse neighborhood known as the Block had many historic buildings that were lost in the 1960s due to urban renewal and interstate expansion. Today there are just a few historic buildings from the Block that remain, five of which are listed in the National Register of Historic Places. This year. Elliot is very knowledgeable about Charleston's history, specifically the West Side. <clears throat> and he's going to parlay that knowledge to us today. And I want to take the minute to 
announce our special guest today, Mr. Elliot Hicks. And he's going to give you guys a taste of his extreme knowledge of Charleston. Elliot, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. <laughs> yeah, what would your neighbor say if you didn't? Right? <laughs> you know, trying to figure out how to do this so that I don't uh, mess it up when I move around and probably yank it on the, on the side of the podium. Welcome, everybody. And I don't need this, do I? Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for being here. I was, uh, when Anthony told me that he, was gonna, uh, that he wanted to do this on, uh, uh, on mid-afternoon in the mid-summer, um, I was sure that nobody would be here. And I, and I've told people I wouldn't even come to see me on, in the middle of the summer like this. I, I, I don't know that I've got enough to say to do that. But um, then he called me the other day and he talked about the possibility of maybe postponing this or something because of, because of the weather, because everybody might not want to come out in, in that. And I'm afraid they've uh, taken our par the parking spaces out here and uh, you know, it's very hard to get close to anything. And um, you know, I, but I told him, I said, this is the best thing you've got going for you because the, the heat's the best thing you've got going for you because you've got air conditioning. I said, everybody's going to be looking to try to escape and get away and do something that's a little bit, uh, that's, that doesn't require them to be in the heat. Um, I think it saved me because, uh, you know, after the windstorm the other week, uh, you know, a couple of places it looked like God took a bowling ball and ran them up through some of the trees. Our yard's one of those places. And so um, I've got, uh, so I went, to, I went through Amazon and got myself a chainsaw. And so I was out cutting things, and then I've got this, my wife gave me a wonderful uh, gift a few years ago. It's this uh, log splitter that kind of looks like a Nordic track. And so, you know, you push on it, and it hydraulically it splits logs and all that. And I get really excited when I finally get a, a, accomplish something that doesn't have to do with paper and pencils. And so um, after I cut up the, uh, cut up the uh, branch that fell in the yard with a chainsaw, I, I dragged it up and started, uh, started splitting it too. Now that's crazy. If I tried to do it today, I probably wouldn't be here. So, you know, I'm glad to, to at least have some good sense imposed upon me by having me show up for something like this instead of trying to, uh, trying to do all of that. You know, um, I'm, I'm humbled by the idea that I would be a speaker at this series. I think this series is very, very important. Um, you know, you see the things that happen in Charleston. I'm one of those who pays attention to this stuff, and I like, uh, I, 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 you know, I like the history of my city, and I like history generally. I just enjoy it. I enjoy uh, looking back on a number of things and trying to, and, and, and kind of citing the changes that have happened. Um, my daughters are 21 and 19 when I was here, and, um, it, it, you know, they, of course, they get tired of that. And it seems like we never listen to the people who, uh, who have something to say about history until we get older and those people aren't around anymore. Um, you know, I have the medical travails that I've you know, easily gotten past, and I was, I was worried when they asked me to do this because uh, it, there are two things that are very, very nice that have happened to me in the very, very uh, recent past. And one of those is that the um, uh, West Virginia executive is, is putting me in a feature called Lawyers and Leaders. And so you know, I said, well, that's very nice. And then, uh, then this call came and it scared me to death because I, it, it made me think somebody doesn't think I'm going to be around very long. <laughs> so so I, was, I was a little worried about what, about what all that meant. But I'm going to take it as a, a chance to put a bookmark and not a, and not a closing chapter in this whole thing and hope I'm going to stick around for at least a moment or so to uh, do this. You know, um, the Story Corps bus was over at uh, the Clay Center, I guess maybe, um, I don't know, maybe a couple of months ago. It, it was certainly within the past couple of months. And you know, the Story Corps is a, um, is, is a project that has people just go and give oral histories of, of, of various things. It's a wonderful, again, a wonderful project. You know, someone like me just loves that kind of thing. I'm glad that it's there. And um, you know, it gives, uh, it, 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 so people just step on the bus and take some time and give their, their history. You know, I'm going to use the, that as a model for what I'm going to try to do today because I'm going to talk about, uh, by necessity, I'm going to talk about my family. It's probably what I know best. But we're going to talk about how that relates to some of the things that have happened in, in, in Charleston and in the, on, on the west side and just, you know, the, the times, how, how it relates to the, to the times that we've lived in. Um, so, I, you know, I don't want to, it, it, it's, 
you know, people even talk about people who go into politics as being, um, uh, you know, awfully arrogant to think that you can make the change, uh, make a change that will mean something. But and you know, by necessity, I guess some of that is. And even you know, being up here to talk about uh, about my life in any context, yeah, maybe so. But there's some things that happen here that are universal. The things that were important to a whole lot of people, and it can be told by my story. So I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to do that. Um, you know, I was born here, I'm, I'm, I'm 63 years old, which, you know, I haven't let that come out of my mouth but about four times. Uh, you know, <laughs> I figure if I ignore it, maybe it'll go away. Uh, but um, the, uh, but I'm, 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 I was born in 1955 and uh, born onto the west side. We lived at, at, on 3rd Avenue. Um, we, um, this is, my, this is my, my family at the wedding, at my mom and dad's wedding. And, uh, from uh, left to right, you see my grandfather Hicks, Charles Hicks, uh, my grandmother, Nellie Peters Hicks, Christine Barnes, a wonderful friend of mine, a friend of our families, and a, a distant relative of the families. Uh, you know, those of you who have talked about, have listened to the Block series would probably have heard about uh, the Cue Ball Inn that was located on Washington Street. Um, and her husband, Bob Barnes, was the proprietor of the Cue Ball Inn, very, very clean pool hall that my grandfather on the other side used to take me to all the time when, um, when he was babysitting me. And then you have my father, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know that's, I learned many lessons there, right? <laughs> Actually, it was a very clean and well-run place, but I heard about pool halls as a, a place of ill repute. I didn't really understand what that meant because he ran such a clean ship that I didn't see that at all. I didn't see that kind of thing at all. But then you have my father, Elmer Hicks, and my mother, Mary Frances Hicks, and my grandmother, uh, Camilla Allen, and my grandfather, Eugene Allen. Um, you know, again, strong West Side ties for all of us. Christine didn't live on the West Side, but, um, but, we, but we certainly did. My uh, grandfather, Hicks, there was, uh, let's see, let me see this. Okay, I thought, oh, there we go. Uh, my grandfather, Hicks, was a, uh, he, 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 he did a number of jobs. Uh, he worked at Kelly Sachs Factory. He uh, worked at, at Smith Carpeting. And um, you know, he, he, he sewed and ed, did the edges of, of, uh, of carpets there. We have pictures of him doing that. And like a number of, um, of black residents, he worked at Kelly Sachs Factory down there where the Kmart that's no longer there was. And that's another thing that's hard to get used to is when we get to the second generation of closings of things. I have a tough, tough time with that because I make all these old Charleston references to people and a lot of people didn't understand them in the first place. And now that those places have come and gone, they really don't understand what in the world I'm talking about. So, you know, what do you do? Um, my, uh, oops, not the one I wanted to, to change, but my, uh, as I say, my, my grandfather Hicks, Charles Hicks worked at Kelly's Axe Factory. My grandmother, uh, Nellie Hicks, died when I was about four years old. Um, the, uh, my grandfather, Alan, was uh, on his death certificate, it lists him as a decorator. He was, uh, he, he, he was a paper hanger, he was a carpenter, he, was, uh, he, he did just about everything, and frequently I could see him on the roof of his house on, at 1408 First Avenue, trying to patch that tin roof with, a, with some tar. Uh, you know, probably on days like this, although I don't know we had very many days like this uh, back, back in that time. Things have changed out here. So, um, you know, it, 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 I, was, I, was, I benefited from a very, very tight family. We had a good family that was very supportive. Um, you know, they, it, 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 there's really nothing bad I can say. Obviously, there are things that, you know, I say that um, practicing law for as many years as I have has made me a more humble person because I've seen behind the curtains of uh, people mighty and small, and I know that all of us have something that we don't want to talk about. All of us have things that we don't want everybody to know, and that's the way it ought to be. Everybody ought not to tell everything. I don't know, I'm not one of these on social media telling everything that happened to me from day to day, and I'm, I'm, I'm not used to it, but um, still, everybody's got something. And so, you know, we, we spend too much time with, uh, with shame, with disappointment and all that, um, worrying about what uh, about how somebody is going to perceive a certain story, but everybody's got those same stories, and um, you know, being able to work on my own when I uh, when I was just downstairs from legal aid, and had a lot of people who didn't who weren't people of means to come down to uh, ask for help, and then to uh, be in a law firm where I was working at a, at a different level with people who were of great means, means I, uh, they had things I never dreamed of having, and yet 
everybody's got something. So um, you know, we ought not to spend too much time wallowing in all, in all those things where we're worried about how somebody's gonna perceive something because everybody's got something that would be perceived poorly. Um, we, uh, this, is the first, this is the earliest picture I know of of my uh, grandfather and grandmother, uh, uh, Alan, my, my mother's mother and father. And I, my suspicion is that this is, uh, this is probably about 1919, as I understand it. And this is in Ronsford in Greenbrier County. Um, that was where I, they, when my grandmother used to take me there every summer. I always call myself the most urban West Virginian that's ever been because, uh, you know, here I, I grew up on the west side. I've never actually fished with a pole. I've never shot anything, in the, well, I've shot a target one or two times, but that's about it. So, you know, I don't really do all of this. So it was kind of a dude ranch experience that my, that my um, grandmother let me have by taking me to Ronsford every, every summer on the train to, um, uh, you know, go and, and, and just, you know, wallow around in, the, uh, on, in farm life. And so this is the place we went. Um, it was, you know, it, it taught me a lot. I saw my first, I rode my first horse there. I saw my first snake. I wish it had been my last snake. But, you know, uh, but that was, uh, you know, that, was, that was really an enriching thing. Oh, and, and, you know, I know this is a polite company, but, you know, people do this. I used an outhouse. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, all of those things were things that I would not have, have the experience of uh, simply living in, in Charleston. So um, it was a neat thing. And so that's where, that's where that was. And as I say, just from some other pictures that surrounded that, and I gather that's about 1919. Um, this is something that was really, uh, I, I'll probably use the word fascinating a few times today, so I guess you'll have to get your ears padded for it. But this is a picture that was taken, I know this picture was also taken in 1919, um, but it, it's the first picture I've seen of my two grandfathers. Um, you've got my grandfather Hicks, Charles Hicks here, and then my grandfather Alan here. I didn't really know they knew each other. But with the uh, small community of color that there was there, you'd have to imagine that they probably would run into each other at, at one time or another. So um, it was awfully, I mean, really when I saw this, there was nobody, nobody older in my family around to gasp with me. But I gasped by myself because I was really surprised to see that they were, um, that there was a picture of them together. You know, uh, uh, my, my children um, and you know, children of this generation expect to see pictures of themselves and to have pictures of themselves of every um, event that they've been involved in, everything of any importance, everything of no importance they expect to have pictures of. Um, you know, I, we don't expect to have that that much. And when we find pictures of, um, of, our, of, of that, uh, that era, um, it's really pretty amazing to me. Now, I've learned through this exercise, too, that I can't force all of my life on you. So there's some things I had to leave out. But um, you know, one thing that I didn't have to leave out was when I, or th that I did leave out was um, an event at First Baptist Church in, I think, 19, in the early 70s, maybe, maybe in the late 60s, I think it was in the late 60s, where my uh, grandmother was honored at the church. And I told my youngest daughter, who has just left for a, uh, for a beach vacation today, that um, I said, these are the only moving pictures I have of my of my, my grandparents and my mother and father, and me for that matter. I've got a, on that same tape, there are a couple of pictures of me. Well, you know, for them, that's not that big a thing. For me, that's a pretty big thing. I didn't, I didn't have time to play with the technology to try to get that on uh, this PowerPoint, but it's just something that I wanted to point out that I think, you know, has something to do with the period and tell some people something about, uh, you know, how these things happen and, you know, how interesting it is uh, to me, whereas, you know, for everybody else, it's like, mm, not much. I think with the moon landing, since we didn't do it very much anymore, we, are, we still have some fascination with it. But some of these things, some of the evolution um, that I have talked about just a second ago, mm, it's not that, not that important to them. But this is something that I was really happy to find. Um, my, um, I mean, let me go back and just talk about my grandparents for a moment. My, my, my grandmother's side of the family came from Nichols Mill in Greenbrier and Monroe counties. Um, they, uh, she was one of nine children. They, uh, uh, they, they, they dispersed to a number of places in the, in the country, mostly in the east. But um, with, with, with nine children on that side of the family, um, we also had nine children on, my, on the Hicks side of the family, my uh, 
uh, grandfather Hicks was one of nine, as I understand it. My grandfather Allen was one of nine. So nine's a magic, or maybe eight, I don't know. One of them has eight in it. So, uh, but still, up in that area is a magic number. For me, I was uh, so late getting started having ki kids that I had to work quickly and make sure that it never happened again. Uh, we, we were, uh, uh, was, I was 42 and 44 when I started having kids. So uh, I used to say I was too young and immature, and now I just say that I'm too immature. So, <laughs> but um, you know, they, and, and so on. By, and, and, and so they moved to uh, they, they, my grandfather, Alan. Uh, well, they were all around Charleston. He grew up on Sense Street, S-E-N-T-Z. That's a pretty. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, there he goes. See, I was about to say, people know they, yeah, people know no sense street. It was kind of a, um, you know, I mean, I have to say, it was kind of a black enclave. Um, that and and there were some things that I've seen even in the news recently about, um, you know, thinking back to that and how that spurred some people's efforts toward trying to do something positive for 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 Charleston's uh, communities because there was the poverty was so intense there. Now, this isn't some up from slavery story that I'm trying to tell. I'm just tell, saying that this is the way it was. There were a lot of um, you know, tumble down shacks, uh, a lot of unsafe places to live. The uh, sewage system was virtually non-existent. So where in the world was this? Well, it's right across from the Clay Center. Um, now, warning for old Charleston reference, there was you know, where the Hex store was right there across from Clay Center, the alley that ran beside that, that's Sense Street. And you will see that today if you uh, go by there, you'll still see Sense Street it, it exists, but as I say, it's nothing but an alley. I, um, you know, cruised up through there, and, and you know, you just want to see some shred of something, and it's like, well, no, there's no shred of anything except the uh, street that's there. Um, my father's side of the family uh, it comes from Shawsville, Virginia. That's over near Blacksburg and near, near where Virginia Tech is. And so, uh, my my daughter, who's who's here in the green shirt there, she did. She told me not to call her out, so I did it anyway, so there. Um, but, but she got involved in a project for, um, in, in high school to, uh, in a genealogy project. And, you know, I do have to say that for a lot of people of color, uh, genealogy projects, are, they don't start them because they don't, because they don't end well, because you, don't, you think you're going to run into a dead end. You think it's inevitable that you're going to run into a dead end. But, um, you know, she jumped on that a few years ago, and she and I have continued to talk about that even now. It's been, it's just been such a, uh, it's been such a fascinating thing. She's been able to trace the family down into, the, uh, back into the uh, 1810s. And, um, you know, it was, it was interesting to see what we were able to find. But we were able to find a, a strong branch of the family back in, uh, back in Shawsville, Virginia. Um, we were able to, you know, identify those. We were able to connect with a number of those who are who are still around too, and talk about that a little bit. And that's been refreshing for me to be able to to see that happen. Um, you know, the uh, I'm afraid one of the sad things about my story with the uh, with the, the Allen family, and particularly with my grandmother on my mother's side, Camilla Curry, is that there was a uh, piece of property that was identified as about 40 acres that was part of the family history. And again, I guess being most urban West Virginian, I didn't really have an interest in going there and, and, and doing very much to it, and um, doing very much with it, because that's just not what I, it's not what I do. Um, but um, it got to the point, and this is something that happens to a lot of families, it got to the point where it would be too difficult to institute a partition suit for you know, property that I'm not really all that interested in, in living in, on and in, in, in buying. And it was, by the time I started paying attention to it, it was already split 27 ways with many people out of town. And we, didn't, we just didn't do much with it. And uh, that property, unfortunately, has been, has been lost. Um, you know, that's, uh, I don't want to say that's our 40 acres and the mule is already dead. So, we, and so I didn't hear what happened to the mule. Um, you know, my, uh, uh, now back to this. My dad was, uh, grew up in Charleston, largely on the west side. He was drafted into the military to fight during World War II. Um, he was in the Navy, stationed in the New Hebrides Islands in the South Pacific. Um, and, and there's a, a picture of Dad. He uh, didn't look like he wanted to be there for somebody who's in the 
uh, who was in the South Pacific Island, but there's probably a reason for that too. He um, came back and worked at, he worked at Kelly's Axe Factory as well, uh, over there again where K-Bart was on the, worst si on the west side, and he uh, worked at Kaufman's, uh, uh, Kaufman's clothing store. Not anything related, not related to the Kaufman's that was in the town center mall. This was uh, Todd Kaufman's uh, grandfather, who had a, uh, Todd Kaufman, our judge, who had a clothing store there, and my dad worked there, and he told me that he made, uh, made $11 a week working there. Uh, so, you know, again, a, a, a interesting connections that you uh, get to meet there. My dad was a mail carrier, and he carried mail at the, uh, I guess in the, what I'd call the now, lower part of the L. Now, this school is mm -hmm. who you received a letter from. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just didn't, I didn't expect that. Um, but he carried mail at the, what you might call the uh, southern, uh, the southern part of the Elk River, just uh, above Charleston Creed, Elk View, and those kinds of, in those areas. And so, uh, uh, you know, he, he, I really loved the lessons that Dad gave me more than any were about being nice to people, about, uh, about uh, uh, and, and I saw how, his, how the people on his mail route treated him and it was, uh, you know, it meant something. It was, it was very, very nice and he got along very well with them. They gifted him uh, graciously at Christmas. Um, we had more Old Spice. If we could have told, turned Old Spice into, into uh, car fuel, we could have driven across the country. So we, we couldn't quite do that, but it was, very, it, was, it was really nice and the relationships he built there were, uh, you know, meant, meant a lot to me, just and not even knowing these people. You know, we had, um, my mom was born into a house on, uh, uh, on, on Elizabeth Street. Um, it's between the Kanawha County Board of Education office, or, yeah, office and um, the, um, the, the red carpet. <laughs> so, so there's the, uh, that area right there between the Kanawha County Board of Education and the red carpet was the, uh, that there stood the house that my mother was born into. Um, you know, again, I guess that's a interesting, I always have to chuckle when I drive, pa drive past there or, or park there, uh, maybe, God forbid, to go into the red carpet, that I'm parking on the place where my, uh, where, where my mother grew up. So she graduated from, she was the first gra in the family to graduate from college, graduated from Howard University in 1948, um, um, with, and, and then became, got into social work and uh, stayed in social work. She was with the Department of Mental Health, the uh, Department of Welfare for a number of years, then the Department of Mental Health until she retired uh, because she was, uh, because of the illness. Um, the, they were married, uh, that picture that we had a little while ago was in the Maddie V. Lee home. You know, the Maddie V. Lee home is over um, on um, uh, Donnelly Street. And it, and it was a uh, place to, for, for women who were just coming to town and needed a place to, uh, to, to stay and try to build up some income and that sort of thing. It was named after Maddie V. Lee, who was the first African-American physician in West Virginia. Now, um, you know, I knew that just because of being steeped in all this history from my church and from other things, but a lot of folks don't know that. And surprisingly, I'm, you know, when I look at Wikipedia, I am surprised at who does have a feature in Wikipedia. But when I saw this one, I was surprised at who didn't. You know, um, there is no feature, as far as I know, well, that I could find with the feeble search that I might have done, um, about Maddie V. Lee. And uh, Maddie V. Lee is a very, very important figure here, and more needs to be known. Now, she died in 1914. They established Maddie V. Lee home in 1915. But she died in 1914, and, you know, that might be a campaign that somebody in, who works from day to day in this uh, building might want to look at, is to establish some, something that uh, lets us hear more about the story that she might tell um, of uh, being the first African-American woman physician in West Virginia, okay? Um, I was born in St. Francis Hospital in 55. My understanding in, of, about St. Francis was it was the one who would accept black people in their maternity unit. I first grew up in, at 1430 Third Avenue, and, and that's uh, uh, right next to my grandfather Hicks. Um, and we moved to the place where I really spent most of my uh, early years, uh, uh, 1005 Second Avenue, which was just on the other side of the on the, uh, on the other side of the trestles by a couple of blocks. Uh, we moved there when I was about oh about four or five years old. Um, it's, uh, the the trestle is an interesting thing for me. Many of you know about that railroad trestle. As a matter of fact, there have been some things in the news about it recently because uh, you know it was certainly it. it 
became at one time kind of a line of demarcation between the black communities and white communities that lived over there. And so, um, and now they talk about this, about it being something that's so um, unsafe that they can't do much with it, and yet so sturdy that they can't do anything with it. So, you know, that's quite a dilemma. We don't ever say anything so sturdy in our lifetimes that we can't do anything with it, do they? Uh, but there, there that is. It was a very diverse neighborhood, and I didn't know what diversity meant. I mean, I, in fact, there's one thing I say that might be offensive. I don't know, but we'll see. I'm a, I'll, I'll try it on you. But I said that as I grew up, it seemed like we only had black people, white people, and doctors, and that was about it. You know, it seemed like if you saw anybody who wasn't, who didn't fit into one of the two categories, then you could almost safely say, hello, doctor, and, you know, be, and be right. And that's, some, that's just the way it seemed. That's probably not the way it, is, the way it was, but that's the way it seemed to me. Um, you know, but, I, but the neighborhood I grew up in, the neighborhood we moved to in about 1959 was a little bit, was really a little bit different from that. Um, you know, we had people from the Syrian community, from the Greek community, all living right there. Um, we were, you know, one of the few black families that had moved past the trestle and um, gone in that, in that area. But on my block was Mary L. Williams. I, um, I do have her somewhere. Anyway, that's my mother. She uh, was, uh, that's her, probably about her picture just beyond high school, I think. I don't know. I think it's probably while she was in college. But, um, you know, we, the, some of the people we lived with, were, it, it, we lived in the neighborhood with, were um, some amazing folks. We had Mary L. Williams. Mary L. Williams uh, was, a, was a renowned educator here in this area. And she is available to look at, not necessarily on Wikipedia, but there are plenty of things about her to, uh, to see. Um, a, a very inspirational person. I cut her grass, and one of the things that was not inspirational for me is she loved rose bushes. And so, um, not only did I have to cut these narrow rows between the rose bushes, but, and, but I always had to trim, and you know, no weed eaters. <laughs> and so I always had to trim around those, uh, around those roses, and so I'd come back bleeding with all these, uh, from, from all, of her, all of her roses, but you know, nonetheless, <clears throat> built character, we'll say it that way, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, we also had in the same neighborhood, Ms. Ms. Norman, let's see what we have here. I don't know. Yeah, there we go. There's Mariel Williams, um, who lived just about three houses from me. Um, we also had uh, Ms. John C. Norman. Ms. Norman, uh, her, it, was, it was quite a family, too. You know that um, her husband was the first black architect in West Virginia. Now, this is, you know, I could throw a rock two times and get to her house. Um, was the first black architect, and you can see a number of uh, of, of buildings and houses on the west side. It's kind of funny to, after I hear the story, get old enough to hear the story and care, um, how many houses there are there that, um, that he designed. And, um, uh, you know, I'd go to church in the place that, he, that was one of the houses that he designed um, at the Unitarian Universalist congregation. So um, it, it, that was her, this was her husband, and she was very important in her own right because she, always, she had church women's news that used to come on I think about nine o'clock, if I have it right, on Sunday mornings um, on WKAZ. And so, you know, the, the, the radio stations at that time used to have to do something that, uh, where they're acting like they're doing a community service. And so that was the thing they did. They put Ms. Norman on. And, um, oh, it was right there. I didn't even realize the uh, <laughs> WKAZ, I had a cheat note that I didn't realize I had. But, um, you know, she was very gregarious. And I do remember that in church, when they would introduce the uh, visitors in church, everybody else would just fill out the card and they'd send it on up and it would, um, and the, whoever was up in front would read it um, to the congregation. But when Ms. Norman brought a guest, she would always stand up separately and not fill out a card. She'd always stand up separately and make a separate introduction of uh, whatever guest she had brought to, the, to church that day. Um, let's see. Okay, well, these are things you just have to do just because you see them. I mean, you have to do that. This is uh, me in 1961. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I still recognize so much of that furniture. I guess that's uh, 57, 1957 down on First Avenue where my, uh, my grandmother and grandfather Alan lived. Um, let's see. I hope I don't make you dizzy. That's mom and dad. Um, I'm not sure when that picture was, but it's one of my favorite pictures of them. Uh, and, so, um, so I went to, I went to Glenwood School, um, 
you know, Glenwood was, again, a very diverse place. It was, and that's something that we don't see that much. As a matter of fact, sometimes we see less diversity today, and there are some statistics that indicate that diversity is, is less today than it was, uh, than it was back then in some, in some of these places. Um, you know, that's what you would see there. I mean, people now look at the West Side and say, well, it's, uh, you know, it, they think it's all black. Well, you know, you look at this and you don't, and, and that's not what you see here. You know, what, the, uh, Beverly Robinson, there, the uh, director of the, of the chorus. This was the chorus at Glenwood School. You, know, you can tell this is a baby boom picture because all these kids to participate in chorus, I mean, imagine what else there, there was. Uh, you know, I was able to find myself, but I'm only able to see the back of my head somewhere because of the, I guess it's a unique shape, you know? But um, I had a larger picture of this, and I, you know, I get very sad about this. You know, we, we get uh, cautioned about fire and fire might destroy this or do that. I've lost a lot more to water than to fire. And unfortunately, I lost, I had this picture in a very, very large format and, and lost that. Um, you know, Kim, you're in there. <laughs> I, see, I see a couple of folks that might be in this picture. But, uh, uh, but, but that's the chorus at Glenwood School. And, you know, again, wonderful times. We had uh, three teachers of color. We had Ms. Robinson there. We had. Uh, uh, Jesse Thompson, who uh, lived on 2nd Avenue, a little bit further down toward Patrick Street, and we had uh, Catherine Richardson. You know, a lot of you know about Marvin Richardson, who was the legendary coach at South Charleston, and um, uh, you know, the, the both of them made quite a mark. And um, you know, those were the people who were there. But all of our teachers were were good, were respectful. It would be hard for me to know. I know that my cousin Nathan uh, was a lawyer at practice here. He's 17 years older than I. And he was in the last class that graduated from Garnet High School. Um, if it, 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 you know, when I look back now and see that I was just a, was there was at Glenwood just a few years after integration, you know, I don't have any experiences to talk about that were negative. We don't have any of that kind of stuff. It was a, it was a good place to go to school, and as I say, it was a diverse community, and I'm very proud of that. And I'll talk to you more about that pride as we <clears throat> as we move ahead. Um, we went to Woodrow Wilson for, uh, for junior high school, now they call it middle school. You know, you do have to admit, that looks like a prison, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but that was, uh, that was where we went. And again, you know, being, uh, being a, a, a part of that boomer generation, we had, we had over, over 1,200 kids that went to this school. You know, this is the, this is the middle school, or junior, you know, what they call it, middle school now, junior high school. Um, and, and, you know, we talk about, when we talk about busing, um, you know, you say, well, we haven't really done that for racial integration in Charles. Well, yeah, we have. Because when I went to Wilson, they um, took the kids who were, in, who were around Hannah Drive and bused them to Lincoln, Lincoln Junior High School, where the Kroger on the west side is now. Um, they, and, and, and then they, they took kids from Sissonville, from the, the, I guess I'd call it lower part of Sissonville, the southern part of Sissonville, and bused them to Wilson. Um, there were some, it, it, it could become an interesting cauldron at times, and it did become an interesting cauldron at times. I mean, here we were in the late 60s, and in the, with the, the things that were going on in the late 60s, and, um, you know, we, but, but we, we came together and, you know, played football, did, you know, everything we do, and um, it, was a, it, it was a good place to go to school. It was good for all of us to learn um, you know, something about some folks that, didn't, that weren't in our neighborhood. It's, uh, you know, it's something a lot of people, and particularly in West Virginia, don't get a chance to do. So I was uh, very happy with, uh, with that, and again, happy with the education I, I had there. You know, um, I've always enjoyed the irony of um, being a black man who went to two schools named after Confederate generals. Um, <laughs> I went to, uh, went to Stonewall Jackson and graduated in 74, and then I went to Washington and Lee. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, I guess I was, I was, I was stuck on that. But, you know, the, uh, uh, of all the histories of these people, when you look at Woodrow Wilson's history, that may have been the worst history, that uh, may have been at least as bad a history as any, as any of those other two people. Um, you know, Woodrow Wilson really turned back the clock uh, he was, it drove the final nail in the efforts that had been made in Reconstruction by resegregating the federal government. And, um, you know, it, it leads me to an aside to talk at least a little bit about school naming and those kinds of things. You know, I um, said in an article that I wrote that I became a hero to some of my friends on the West Side because uh, they asked me about what I, whether I thought 
that they should change the name of Stonewall Jackson High School a few years ago. And, um, you know, for me, when I was there, and some people may have some other memories of that, but for me, um, you know, the general that we had there was, first of all, it was a cartoon. Um, it, was, um, it, it was, it was just, you know, just, it, it, was, cart it was a cartoon, there was a cartoonish figure that they had that didn't really mean much. You know, I didn't, I, I, now they may have played Dixie or something sometime, I don't think so. I didn't hear it, I don't remember it. Um, but, you know, we really didn't have all the iconography of the Civil War, except that, you know, the, even the cartoon picture, he wore gray, so that was really as, as close as it came. But some people, like I say, may have some, some uh, memories that are a little different from mine, I don't know. But, um, you know, but when they asked me about that, I said, you know, I'm not really hot on changing the name just because we can. Um, I want, if we're gonna change the name, I want it to rise organically and be something that means something to the community now. Because people you know, talk about this history thing and they say, well, you can't change history. No, we can't change history, but we can change who we honor. We can change who we hold up in the community as somebody who is important. And if we hold up somebody like Stonewall Jackson or, um, or, or Robert E. Lee or any of these people, you know, th th that uh, has its virtue, but is that relevant to the community today? I was uh, very disappointed with some of the people when they wanted to name, the, school, name uh, uh, the elementary school after Mary C. Snow. I was, I was amazed at the tone deafness of some of the people who were there and, the, and some of the people who were on the Board of Education and how, uh, you know, one particular member who, who attended Stonewall was just hell bent on not changing at all. This is my memory. This is my, this is my history. Well, it's my history too. But like I say, I don't think we need to change it just to change it, but there are plenty of reasons to make, your, uh, to make the, 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 the names that you honor, the names that you lift up in the community, be relevant to that community and mean something to that community. That, that means something. Um, like I say, I might, I, I might have been, uh, had I known what I know now, I might have been more feverish about changing Woodrow Wilson than, uh, than any of these others. But nonetheless, and, you know, that, that was uh, a wonderful place to be. I was uh, in, uh, that's, I've resurrected this from somewhere. I marked mine up and again, I lost my uh, copy of this little yearbook they had to water. But, um, you know, now isn't it a shame they didn't put anybody's name on here? And that's something else that, and, and let, me, let me tell you this, now that you've got a person who has no attention span to speak of, who's gone through and looked at a number of pictures like this, uh, put the names and dates on the pictures, okay? <laughs> that's, a, that's part of the cruelty that, that is this with that uh, lawyers and leaders thing and this. Um, I was caused to go and look back on so many things and now I've just been in this abyss trying to look, uh, look back at all this history and uh, my family would tell you that m my productivity has been very, very low over the past couple of weeks as we uh, deal with all of this. <clears throat> um, this was me trying to play sports. <laughs> you know, I did what I could. I, I went to Stonewall and I really, and I, 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 I loved, I saw myself as a basketball player. The coach didn't. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was, uh, but I was on the team and, and, and again, did what I could. And, um, uh, and, and it, 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 you know, just what I liked about team sports is the, I loved the camaraderie. I loved who I, uh, that, that I got to learn how to um, do things when I wasn't, <clears throat> when you're not the star. It's easy to be on a team when you're the star. A lot harder to be on the team when you're not a star and when, you don't have, when your contribution is very, very specific. <laughs> and so um, I was one of those whose contributions were very, very specific uh, as a rebounder. And, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to be a basketball player more than, more than anything. But, um, you know, reality was, uh, was there in my face all the time. And that just wasn't what I uh, did best. But, you know, I was there and I really enjoyed that. And I've always recommended sports to young people, not because you're going to be great at it or, or any of that, but it teaches you how to be second. It teaches you how to win, it teaches you how to lose, and that's pretty important stuff. Um, the, um, now, the, the, there's uh, another cousin of mine, um, Walter Easley. Walt, Walt's, um, my grandfather Alan was his, it, 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 and, and, and my grandfather Alan's sister was his grandmother, so we were, I don't know, whatever in the world that is. Uh, 
And uh, he was a tremendous athlete, one of the greatest athletes to come out of this valley. Um, he uh, it was, as you can see, as big as I, as big as I was, um, <laughs> he was a little more muscular, but as big as I was, but he ran hurdles. Now, I didn't do that. Um, I was a discus thrower, and, and um, you know, as a matter of fact, I mean, that's the real area of sports that I did have some success. But we, but um, you know, the um, back in '74, my my greatest success, and I think one of the greatest successes of my of my life was that when I was a t when I was in the tenth grade, and um, trying to learn how to throw a discus. Um, you know, they, they do this great spin that has balance and you know, it combines balance and power and all of this. And I thought, well, okay, I would like to try this. So I, I did that in the 10th grade and I threw the discus back on Piedmont Road behind us. <laughs> so um, the great thing about it is I won, the, I won the state meet as a senior and so I figured it all out. But boy, it took a long time and uh, a lot of humiliation. It took a lot to go back after you've thrown the thing out on, the, uh, out on, on Piedmont Road behind you. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that I just did that. That's one of the greatest victories that I had. Um, the um, you know, school gave me lots of leadership opportunities. And, and um, again, as I say, sports teach you how to um, do things when you're not necessarily the leader and the winner. And I think that's awfully important. Um, in, in high school, I went to Boys State. Um, in West Virginia, that was, a, a, that was you know, really a great honor and a wonderful, another wonderful thing in my development. You know, I know that the American Legion, it's amazing how the lengths that people went to um, in so many things in our history. And again, I, 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 I like history. I pay, I pay some attention to it. But it's amazing the lengths that people went to to, um, to, to, to segregate. It seems like it would be more, more of a pain than it's worth. But they did it anyway. And there used to be a, um, a, a colored boys state, if you can imagine that, but they had to separate that. And so the, um, the, the, the black um, um, American Legion post, the boys state was sponsored by the American Legion. And the black, uh, the black American Legion post had that opportunity, had sponsored that opportunity for boys to go to boys state. Um, and they ended up sponsoring me, although I, of course I've never I've never been involved in any segregation. I've never had that. So I don't know anything. I, I didn't experience that myself. But uh, they were the ones who continued their mission by sponsoring me to go to Boy State. And um, I was able to, to uh, run for governor of Boy State. And when um, I uh, competed against my classmate at Stonewall, Bert McCabe, of all things, here we are with all these people from all over the state. and. Uh, Bert and I end up running against each other for uh, governor of Boy State. Uh, the person I ran against in the primary of that was, uh, has become a great friend of mine, and we are friends today, very close friends today. So it's amazing what I get out of that. Out of, I talk about the YMCA. You know, again, another picture I didn't have time to put in here and didn't think you all had time to listen to, although you probably say, as long as the air conditioning is working, keep going. <laughs> mm, no, you probably don't say that. <laughs> but, um, you know, the... Um, but, but, you know, I made so many friends that I still am in contact with, people I still, who still matter to me from these activities, and I really um, in, enjoyed that. That's the cabin that I was in at Boy State. You know, Boy State is what it, what it is. It's a, um, it's a camp that, that, that we went to to learn about government. You know, we would run for offices, have mock elections for the various offices so that we could, uh, you know, learn how all these things went. And so we had... Uh, a, a, a campaign cycle, a, a legislative session, and all of that crammed into one week. And um, again, you know, met, made wonderful friends with whom I'm still in contact today. I'm just very proud of all of that. Um, the, um, it was an empowering spotlight, and I really you know, appreciated having a, having a chance to do that. Um, you can't talk about, I can't talk about my, oh, that's, I guess I've got that too. That's uh, you know some of the pictures that got messed up with water, but at least I salvaged some of it. So um, you know I was so disappointed. I went to church every Sunday when I was in high school, and um, and, and and get my 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 uh, senior picture, my collar sticking out, and it really drove me crazy that my senior picture. I knew how to tie a tie. <laughs> I knew how I was supposed to look, but yet my collar was sticking out. So at least I have a picture that shows I knew how to tie a tie. So I was proud of that. You know what I. Um, Let's see, I think, well, this is, uh, you know, as I say, at, 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 uh, you can't tell my story without telling about what happened at, 
in, 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 at First Baptist Church. And one of the things that happened was the scout troop. Um, you have one of my best friends, Bill Haston, you, um, there I am. Um, several people that you might recognize, Daryl Nunley, Bernard Coston, Brock Terry, Sam Hart. Um, let's see, I think that's uh, Robbie Robinson from the DuPont area. Um, uh, but anyway, and, and Tony Smedley. Tony Smedley was a person who taught around here and he was a scoutmaster. He was a great, great man. He, le he died just a few weeks ago. I'm afraid I was unable to attend his, his funeral, but he was, a, he, he, was, he was a great guy and he did a lot of things here to try to you know, stir something up and get, get kids uh, doing things. I was very um, impressed with him and, and um, appreciated his friendship and his guidance. Um, my, my grandmother was a pillar of the of First Baptist. She was, uh, you know, she, she was a renowned uh, caterer. She um, worked, uh, she was a cook at Boyd, Ele or at Boyd Elementary, Boyd uh, Junior High School. Um, she, um, uh, you know, it, it, she was just always there. If the church was open, she was there. And she was the one who uh, took us to church all the time, made sure we went. Um, my, my, my parents had a much more nuanced relationship with church, and so it was a little, little bit different. But um, you know, they always, they mostly attended when I, when I was on a, they, they mostly, they, they, they were spotty in their attendance at church, but they always attended when there was an event that I was, where I was saying something or had something to do. And that's the kind of support that um, you know, makes success stories. Um, but anyway, my grandmother was my adult presence at the church, and she was involved, and, and I was involved in everything the church had to offer. I mean, you see, um, you know, that, and um, there are a number of other things. I mean, Baptist Youth Fellowship, and the choir, and this and that, and the other thing. Often reluctant, but, you know, I was there, and sometimes I uh, talk about some of that reluctance as, uh, you know, some of those are the best things that ever, have ever happened to me. And my dad and granddad God knows they tried to teach me how to do something and, and how to use hammers and, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, I learned that and it was good. And so I became good at all that. And that's where I get a lot of relaxation in, uh, you know, doing things around the house and, and actually proving to myself again that even with these soft paper and pencil fingers, I can still do stuff. So, um, the, um, when I went to, um, Washington and Lee. It, it, I chose Washington and Lee because it, it, they had a program to, that would allow me to, I knew that I wanted to go, to go to law school from the ninth grade. So Washington and Lee had a program that would allow me to, um, f to, to finish college and law school, kind of blend those, the, the fourth year of college with the first year of law school and get out in six years because you know, I just wanted to, I, I thought I wanted to do that. But um, I went there and I had the worst grades I had ever seen. I didn't know people had grades. I didn't know they even made grades this low. Um, so uh, I was coming back from uh, on Thanksgiving, and um, mom came and picked me up. And as I'm in the car, you know, we're talking, and all of a sudden I get a little quiet because I start calculating, you know, how am I going to do this semester? And as I started to calculate, as the reality set in, I started crying <laughs> because I realized how I was going to do. And uh, you know, I was, um, I, 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 like I say, I had the worst grades I'd ever seen, but. I had some good success in, on campus in uh, campus politics and such. I was uh, on what they call the executive committee of the student body, and that was the one that was in charge of administering the honor system there. Washington and Lee had a single penalty honor system where if you lie, cheat, or steal, um, you are dismissed. And, the, and it was a student-run honor system. Students ran the whole thing. Um, you know, I'm sure there, somebody would have some problems with some lawsuits with that now, but you know, it, 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 those are the rules and that's the way it was. Everybody knew what they were buying into when they did it. I was the freshman representative there and uh, my little uh, David Letterman, he used to say uh, uh, stupid human tricks. My stupid human trick for that was to memorize the names and hometowns of every classmate that I had, 300 some people. I don't know why I did that, <laughs> but I did. And, um, um, I, I, so I remembered their names and hometowns, and somebody let that out that I had memorized the names and hometowns of all of my classmates. And he came up to me and said, well, I heard you know everybody's name and hometown. What's my name? And, um, you know, you always love that. I mean, you hate that even when you, people, when you see somebody you're supposed to know. Who am I? You don't know who I am, do you? Well, no. <laughs> but with this one, he said that, and um, fortunately, because of uh, Betty and Julius McLeod, his name was McLeod. And he knew, and, and because he was awfully impressed that I knew how to 
pronounce it because I knew how to pronounce their name. So I knew he was, the, and he's from Knoxville, Tennessee, by the way. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I remember, I, I, I memorized that just because it was kind of an interesting thing to do and everybody loves the sound of their own name. Um, when I came back from, uh, it, 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 you know, the things that happened there were, it was very different. You know, when I talk about Washington and Lee, I, I tell them, I tell people that I came from a place where the Civil War was history and not current events. Now in Virginia, it's still current events. <laughs> and um, you know, they, 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 they talk about it and talk about it. I think I made uh, one of my in-laws a little peeved with me because we went to a place that had lots of memorabilia. We were in the South and we were just trying to walk off a meal and we, uh, we went to a place that had a lot of <laughs> Civil War memorabilia. I know you'll be shocked. We were in Georgia. And um, I kind of sniffed and said, you know, it seems like the South keeps fighting this thinking that they're going to get a different in outcome. <laughs> But, um, you know, in Virginia, they still love to talk about the Civil War, and, uh, and they did. So, um, the, um, uh, you know, it, 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 and it was a different place. I always thought of West Virginia as a live and let live place, and I've always been very proud of West Virginia as being a live and let live place. I really loved that, that when I go somewhere, um, people, were, people were good to me. I mean, I greet them with a smile, they greet me with a smile back. And I've always been very, very proud of that. It's not the stratified society that I found in Virginia particularly, and uh, you know, my, my experience may not be as broad as some, but it's not the, it, it just wasn't the same kind of thing, and I appreciated that. Um, the, uh, but, but at the same time, there were some things that were very different there. You know, um, I think that our freshman class came in without these preconceptions and they were willing to elect me to an office. They you know, had a good time with them, but um, I went there to drink from every glass. I, went, I didn't go to Washington and Lee to say, well, I'm, I'm gonna do this, but I'm not gonna do that. I went to try to do everything. And so I went through Fraternity Rush. Um, I went through, I, I, I did, um, you know, that was um, something that caused me a lot of trouble. Because when I did that, um, there were fraternities that had knocked down drag out fights where people walked out over the question of whether they were going to issue a bid to me. And all I was trying to do was just get to meet everybody in, on, on the campus. Um, the, um, I, I found that some of the, there were certainly some problems among some of the upper class uh, uh, old white students. There were some problems among the black students too, because coming from the South themselves, they really weren't comfortable with um, the way I found it easy to interact. I, didn't, I just didn't have, the, have my guard up and that, that was uncomfortable to some of them. There's a reason for that. I just went back to a reunion. Uh, it would have been the 40th reunion this past, uh, past year. And people say, why in the world do you talk about Washington Lee so much? Uh, you know, you, 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 you transferred after your sophomore year. Um, I did, but the, uh, when, we, when I went there, I listened to some of the guys who were just a few years older than I was, who had been there just a few years before. And they talked about physical violence, um, real intimidation that people exerted on them while they were there as, as students. And their experience was just different from mine. And so, and, I, and as I heard that, I remembered why, because what I didn't like was how militarized um, the black students had become now impossible, reasonable reaction. Now I understand impossible, reasonable reaction to some of the things they had to face. Even in the six years, I didn't face that. I didn't face any of that, but they did. And, and I just didn't like the we versus they attitude that was present among a number of students. Well, you say, I mean, just like we, we talk about, well, everything should be fine now. Barack Obama's been president, and so racism is gone, right? <laughs> well, you know, it's similar there. Um, you say, well, how in the world, you know, you, you had success. You were uh, you elected to office, uh, to the highest office in your class two times. You had success. What, what's the problem? Well, the problem was I was tired of everything. I didn't like everything I would do on campus becoming a cause. I didn't want it to be a cause. I just wanted to go and have some fun. You know, I just wanted to go to college, and that was all I was trying to do. And um, now I, I, I tell uh, partially, I say partially in jest, I went to a homecoming football game, visit some of my friends in, well, let me go back and say this. I wanted to get my grades together because I wanted to, if I was gonna transfer, I wanted to transfer on my own terms and not just crawl to anybody who would have me. So I did that my sophomore year and that was fine. It worked out, you know, I lived. 
Um, but I, in, in my sophomore year, I, I you know, was comfortable. I said, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to graduate from the school and all that. Well, I went to a homecoming football game in Morgantown and saw some of my friends there. And I saw more women in my section of the stands than they had in the entire town of Lexington, Virginia. <laughs> So, you know, so I think about that and I see people having fun and not really into, you know, it's not some kind of, everything's not some kind of a cause. And I said, you know, that's, that's okay. And I, but I said, I'm, I'm still going to stay. I'm going to stay and I'm going to finish this out. And I'm sitting on the edge of my bed when I get back with my head in my hands. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't even know any women. I mean, it was a, it was a men's school. And I, said, I don't even know any women. I said, if I would call a woman and say, hey, this is Elliot. Yeah. And so it just wasn't, it, the, the, again, the monastic life is not the one I wanted to lead. And I was ready to get out of the South. I'd had about enough of that. So, um, you know, I went to, uh, uh, but, but in my sophomore year, when I came back home, um, this is the news that was going on at that time. The textbook controversy was going on. And, um, and I'd, I'd hear these things. This was in Charleston, or this was in the Kanawha Valley here. Um, you know, I'd hear the news about you know, the school bombing, the fire bombing of the school, um, the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the growing presence of, uh, of a Ku Klux Klan. I mean, growing presence. I didn't even know there was a presence here. But it, it existed, and it came out of the woodwork. And we see things today that, um, you know, they, they, they talk about that textbook controversy as sowing the seeds for so many of the things we have going on right now in, in our country. Um, you know, the, the protests let conservatives know that they could stand up and, and, and fight against some of these things that, were, uh, that they considered problematic. And um, that scab has still not healed. Um, when I saw, when I saw that, well, one of the crazy things, the nerdy things, again, you know, my kids, they think that I'm absolutely crazy for doing this, but I used to have the newspaper delivered. Mom and dad would let me, would have them mail the newspaper to me, would let them mail the newspaper to me every, every day. So I got the newspaper and I kept up with what's going on, a little bit different from what they do now. But I saw the growing presence of these kinds of, uh, of, of rallies, the growing presence of, um, of, of, of the controversy and the things that people were saying about uh, the textbooks that they had back then. And it was sad to see my home area changing at, even as I had, 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 gone, had gone away to school. Um, anyway, I got, uh, you know, as I say, I got myself together and tried to do something and make it, um, and, and, and make everything work. But um, I, I wanted to use college to see the world. So I went to WVU for my sophomore and junior years. And I wanted to use college to see the world. So um, I was going to go to University of Pennsylvania for law school, I thought. Um, but um, then I, I, I looked at how much it would cost. Tuition at WVU, and this makes me sound like a fossil to everybody who's, who's younger, but tuition at WVU was $250 a semester. And I didn't have to take a bar exam. If you graduated from WVU at that time, you were automatically admitted to the West Virginia bar. You know, 200, and now as opposed to the University of Pennsylvania, because I knew I was going to come back here, and I wanted to see a big city. I wanted to live in a big city and experience that. But, um, you know, $250 a semester, no bar exam, let's go Mountaineers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know, this has gone a long way. You know, in, in trying to prepare for all of this, I, 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 the cruelty, as I say, that's heaped upon me by, ha by having two different entities tell me that, that they want me to dig out things from my archives. Um, that, that really exacted a toll. I don't have my wedding ring or watch on now, and so I guess I'm not married for at least 15, 20 more minutes. Um, but, um, you know, I did, so I didn't do that, and I don't know what time it is, but I'm sure somebody will probably shout it out to me or brought the rotten fruit to throw to let me know. There it is. Okay, I see it now, five after four. Oh, I didn't want you to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, let me go through real quickly the, you know, some other things. I mean, um, you know, practicing law, uh, practicing law in West Virginia. I uh, came out of law school in 1981, and I began practice with uh, William Lonesome. William Lonesome was uh, a, again a person who was an important figure in this valley, a very outstanding person. He was he was a large presence. Um, you know, what made me want to go to law school was when I came up in the time of the civil rights movement. I saw the um, uh, yes, I, I, I saw the changes that lawyers could make 
and I thought they were important. You look at Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston and the things that they were doing, those were important things. And I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to see if there was anything I could do to try to make things a little better in this world. Um, and then um, the other thing is, you know, Bill Lonesome, he, he drove beautiful cars and wore wonderful suits. <laughs> so I said, well, gosh, if I can do well and do good, as I say, then that, that seems like the profession for me. And, um, and I came out and I began to practice with him for a moment. Um, it, it, I, I don't say this often, but, he, it, but the, he made a lot of promises to me about what was, about how I could be integrated into his practice and don't worry about interviewing and all that. Well, I didn't. And um, he took me in, but I ended up sitting in a place that had no telephone. Um, and he was kind of competing with me for, uh, for work. And, and then I realized that the other guy was sitting there, he'd probably made about that same promise to him too. <laughs> and so after 60 days, um, I, um, I left there and uh, Gene Hoyer, who was a saint to me, um, gave me some space in one of the buildings. The Hoyers have a lot of, had a lot of buildings at the time. He gave me some space over there at 1033 Courier Street where Legal Aid has, is right now. And um, I was, at, well, no, 1033 was the other place that Sacred Heart is renovated. And then, uh, but um, I was right be below the two, there were four legal aid entities. During the Reagan administration, they were cutting back on what, on what legal aid could do, on the kinds of cases that legal aid could take. And so, um, you know, the, the great thing for me was that being on the fifth floor, um, I was able to get a lot of spinoff. I was able to get the cases of the people who were too rich for legal aid. They'd send them down to my office and I would, uh, and I'd help them. Uh, when I didn't have any work to do, I'd sit and read the West Virginia Code. And you know, that's a scintillating read. Um, we, uh, but uh, but it, it, it let me understand stuff. And because you know, you go to law school, you have your, your, it, it, you talk about other schools and you feel like you've learned something. Okay, I know how to do something. I know how to, how to make something happen. I think I know chemistry, I know math, I know this, I know that. And you feel empowered because you know more. But when you go to law school, the, more, the further you go, the less you understand you know, because you realize there's a whole lot of stuff out here that you haven't, don't have any idea about. And uh, that's the way I felt. I always said I probably owed the people and the women in the clerk's office half my fee uh, for, for going down there and trying to figure out how in the world I'm going to uh, do this or do that. Or they'd tell me, no, you can't file that. And I'd have to go back to my office. I was doing my own typing at the time. I had a one room office and did my own typing. And it was a great part of, it was a great part of my development. Um, but, um, you know, it, 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 but it was, uh, my, I, I could identify my client as the side of the divorce that couldn't pay, generally. So, um, you know, I, I was doing court appointments and I was doing divorces and I wanted to lift my practice and do something a little bit bigger. And we went to, uh, and, and I, I joined Kay Castro and Cheney in 1984. And I was the second lawyer of color to be in one of the majority law firms at that time. Now there was an interlude where I practiced with my, my friend Lou Tyree for a moment, but then it, 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 that was, it, they, had, uh, he, they had spouses who had money and could pay things. I needed to get money and I needed to find a way to, uh, to do something about that. So, um, you, you know, moved around, did a few things. Uh, I had like five offices in my first three years, but then I joined Kay Castro and Cheney in 84, became the second lawyer of color to practice in one of the majority law firms. When I was in law school, we didn't even, inter we would only interview with the large law firms just to get interviewing practice because we had not seen that there were any lawyers of color, and there weren't, who had joined the larger law firms. And we were, um, and, and, and we just didn't think it was a real possibility, didn't think they were serious when they interviewed us. Um, and, and, but it's only after I was out of law school that I had friends there at Kay Castro who said, you know, hey, why don't you come over and you know, give it a shot? And so I did. Jeff Woods, who practiced with Jackson and Kelly for quite some time, um, was the first lawyer of color to join a majority law firm in West Virginia. And, and when I say a majority law firm, I'm talking about a firm of, any, of more than five lawyers, say. Um, and he uh, joined them in, I think, about June of 80, June of 84. And, um, I joined K. Castro in September of 84. Um, and so, you know, that opened up some things and things, uh, things did change a little bit. Now, I'm not trying to be Jackie Robinson or Rosa Parks or anything, I'm not, uh, that's not it, but 
nonetheless, it was, uh, it was important to see that somebody does this, you know, that, that, that there are lawyers of color in these firms. It's important to see that um, if you, uh, in, in order to envision yourself in that position. And so I did that. I spent 16 years with, with Kay Casto. Uh, um, uh, joined, uh, I left after, after I, I became state bar president in 1980, oh, no, no, gosh. 1998, I'm sorry, I became the state bar president. I was on the board of governors, and, uh, we, and, and they elect from the board of governors to the bar presidency, and so I was honored that the people I had worked with for, for three years could you know, see my temperament, see the thing, whatever I was bringing to the table, and they, um, and they elected me to be state bar president. Again, uh, the first lawyer of color in West Virginia, in, in, in West Virginia to do that. Um, we, um, uh, it, 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 you know, there was no, again, there was no, there was no prejudice or anything like that that got in the way of that. It's just a matter of people taking the interest to go and do it, and I happened to be the one who was able to do that, and I really uh, enjoyed that time. I mean, serving on, on the State Bar Board of Governors lets you see the practice of law in a very different way, while otherwise I've just got my head down, I'm doing what I have to do and trying to take care of my cases. It's so much, it, it, it lets you raise your head and look at the profession in a much larger sense. And we did that, and I, I really enjoyed that practice. Um, that was now 20 years ago. Lauren was about, my 21-year-old daughter was about to be born when we did that. It's funny, there's some people still ask, are you still involved with the state bar? I was like, no, <laughs> and that, that, that's over now. Um, that's really about it. I mean. It, 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 you know, this is uh, when I was chairman of the trustee board at First Baptist. I was a decade younger than anybody who was there, and yet uh, um, they, they trusted me enough, and particularly Charles James, who preceded me in that position, trusted me enough to let me um, serve in that role. Um, I, I demonstrated versatility in my, in, in my life by being the chairman of the trustee board at First Baptist, and then um, I, I wanted to, I had a theological conflict that caused me to change, and I went to, uh, I went to the Unitarian Universalist congregation, and it, it's a you know, very, different, a very different group, as you can well imagine. I, uh, I said I was just going to sit in the back, and not, I don't want to be heard, I don't want to be seen, I don't want to do anything. They didn't have any term limits for the chairmanship there, and so I, I stayed for probably too long, more than, more than a decade. But you know, then I go to the UU church, I'm sitting back in the back, I'm trying not to be seen. And um, then, of all things, two years later, I become chairman of the trustee board again. <laughs> so so it's, it's kind of hard to stay away from that. Um, this is my picture, uh, I guess composite picture, as I graduated from law school, the mustache was a little unruly. But, um, and then this is one uh, for an article Sandy Wells did. Um, these are my brothers. I, you know, they, they were kind enough to me, again, shocking me with this Martin Luther King Living the Dream Award. I, I have no idea how that happened. I told him I felt a little bit like an imposter because I'm not, I haven't been any kind of civil rights pioneer that I can see, but it was awfully, awfully nice of somebody to think of me this way. But, um, you know, one of the things I'd wanted to say about my family is I see these people with all these tattoos about, of things on, on themselves. They tattoo their family names and all this kind of stuff. And I've always said that, I don't need a tattoo to demonstrate my love for my family. I'm not saying anything about the people who do, who do it, but I hope that people can see my family in me every day without my having to blossom my skin with, with that. So, um, you know, I, 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 my, brother, uh, my bro brother Eric, who has been very successful in the home health care business here, my brother Brian, who just took a, a new job with Pepsi down in Texas, and this is me during my sophomore year. Um, this is us when they are trying to outgrow me. <laughs> and we're at, at, uh, at Calvin and Jane Hicks's house when, uh, when that picture was uh, done. This is us of, um, not that many years ago, not more than 10 years ago. And um, you know, we always take pictures of ourselves when we're <laughs> together, so there it is. And this is my family. So uh, you know, it's been, this has been, it, 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 I've had a good life, and I've had a good life because my family has been um, very supportive, and we've learned how to be supportive. And so, um, I, I hope that what I've said here, I, don't think you know, I hope that some of the things I've said here have not been too me-centric, and have, and, and that there's something a person can get from uh, about the whole of our community 
from the things I've talked about. You can't cram everything in here, and I guess that's what I learned when I was trying to throw all, the, all that PowerPoint together. So, well, thanks for having me. <laughs> Anthony, is there anything else you'd like for us to do? Are there any big questions? Pictures, questions, anything to talk about? Okay. Anyone have any questions for her? So as long as he spoke, and as long as I spoke, they probably think I've covered it. Did all. you know yeah. Dr. Bateman? Oh sure, yeah, Did absolutely. You, you know what? She's in the early draft of she's in the early draft of the, of, of the PowerPoint. Dr. Bateman lived right around the corner from me. And so my mom and Dr. Bateman worked together. When you said your mom worked in mental <coughs> right. health, I thought about Dr. Yeah, Bateman. Yeah, and they were they, they were very close. They uh, you know traveled together all over the place. You know, you get on uh, the roads weren't quite what they are now when um, they had to go to Lakin and go to the, some of the uh, mental health centers. And they, um, I, I really appreciate it because they, uh, my mom got me a job with them one time where I was really able to understand um, mental health issues a whole lot better. You know, issues of people who have been institutionalized and all of that. I mean, I really, I learned an awful lot about that. I worked in a sheltered workshop, which is something that, you know, makes some folks squeamish sometimes, but it was a great, it was a great lesson to me, so. Mm hmm yeah. Anybody? Right. Yeah, Robin. Uh, I think I was probably in the first, uh, the class to the first African-American lawyer, uh, female lawyer, Mary Wright, mm -hmm. I'm guessing, was the first African-American woman uh, to become a lawyer in this mm -hmm. class, mm -hmm. class of 76. Yeah, yeah. You see? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's really, that's what's amusing to me in, in a very dark sort of way. Um, you know, that there are still firsts to be had. You know, I'm surprised at that. Now, you know, I mean, it, it, of course, it's not like baseball records, the first left-handed pitcher to bat 231 with a, you know, with, and, and have more RBIs with such and such. I mean, you know, baseball records are insane the way they um, particularized it, but they're still important firsts to be had in West Virginia, and that's kind of a strange situation to be in, and that's why, you know, I mean, when I talk about a first, I've, I've still got the nerve to think of myself as a relatively young man, although when I look in the mirror, I'm betrayed <laughs> every, every time, but, um, you know, for me to know that I can be a part of, of, of firsts in the state is, is odd to me, you know, right? that's the way it is, huh? <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, your mother, I think it was, mm -hmm. living on Elizabeth Street right there between the board and, and, and uh, the, the carpet. Car mm -hmm. right, carpet. Yeah, that's uh, important. Car car carpet Rouge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the important uh, one, right? But uh, I had at Wilson, and you could have had too, uh, a lady by the name of Miss Jenny. Exactly, which, right across the street there. Which, right? yeah, they, she should have lived right across the street. Then, she did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, her house is right behind the New China. Uh, um, I, I always consider her one of my favorite teachers and stuff. <laughs> she was my eighth grade, uh, what, eighth, eighth grade uh, science, uh, science teacher. teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 She, had, it, she had the best tropical yeah. fish I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even see all that. You know, it's amazing to have all these giants who were, uh, who were right with us. At least, you know, at least we think they're giants because they're as big as anybody we've ever seen in terms of, uh, you know, the, the example she set, uh, she set um, you know, a very genteel woman who, um, um, you know, a very dignified person and, um, you know, a very smart person. And it was just, you know, it's nice to think back on all these people I've, I've really come to know and I wish I'd been able to amplify more of those when I talked about what happened about the First Baptist because, um, you know, we got to see some of the, we got to see the people who made differences and it was really something to, to see that standard set at a certain place where, um, you know, you really, you didn't want to disappoint. And, um, you know, I certainly, because of that church community, I didn't want, um, you know, I never wanted to be in, the, be in a situation where bad news about me would come to these people who meant so much. As I, and and I'll, I'll say something real quickly about, you know, this uh, theological conflict that, that I had. Um, you know, I went, I, I heard a pastor say some things that were, um, Un, 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 unpleasant about um, homosexuality and those sorts of things, and um, my family was very young, and I, you know, and I wrote an article about this too. I kind of tensed my legs to get up and leave, and I wanted to take my family with me. Um, but you know, you look around at these people who are so much a part of your life, you know, so much a part of the, you know, whatever quilt you are, 
they are a part of your life. And um, regardless of what somebody says from the pulpit, you, um, you, you look at those people, those are the people that you're there for. You know, those are the people that you, that, who, who really matter in your life. And, you know, if somebody who is forced to give a speech every week, somebody's going to say something that's not, not so great. But um, it's that community that really matters. It's those people who, um, who uh, those are the people that you're there for. And those are the people that you're there with. And so, you know, you have to kind of turn your head sometimes when some people um, say something in, in, in leadership that you don't agree with and think of who you're, why are you really there? And that was why I was really there. But. You mentioned Sin Street. Mm -hmm. You remember Miss Thelma Thompson? She was a yeah. she was a teacher, but she taught up the river somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't think she ever. I'm taught, aware of her. Yeah, I, I, I don't I, think she taught in Kanoa County, but I lived in Sin Street. Okay. Yeah. 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 It was about three or four when we moved out of there. But it's yeah. I can see the alley. Right. I can, I can picture all. when you said it. I can see it right mm -hmm. now. Huh. Yeah, I'd love to steal a sign, but I don't think that <laughs> that'll work out real well. I mean, that's a that's a great piece of history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Besides, yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You talked about your education. Mm -hmm. Ms. Barbara Lacey, who worked with my mother at one time. Yes, mm -hmm. and um, your accomplishments. But you didn't mention your musical ability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got, well, you know, and, and that's, because, well, that's because one of those pictures didn't work out very well either. I, I, I would say, uh, the, 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 again, water, got, water caused the pictures to go together, and when I pulled it off, my head was pulled off. So. Uh, but I used to, uh, I went to a home show, or a, a home show at the Civic Center, and in my, you know, six or seven year old eyes, um, I saw something that said, buy a balloon, get an accordion. I said, cool, <laughs> you know, I'll buy a balloon, get an accordion. And I begged my grandmother to buy me a balloon so that I could have an accordion. Well, what it actually said was Herbert Music Company was going to come to your house and try to sell music lessons to you if you bought the balloon. And they were going to try to sell that you should play the accordion. Well, I did that, strangely enough, and I played the accordion. And mom thought that, uh, you know, she always said the smart kids play music. They, you know, so you ought to learn to play music. And so this was what was thrown in front of me, and this is what I did. I said, well, mom, I want to learn how to play a, I said I wanted to play the stand-up bass. And oh, no, you don't want to do that. And, well, I want to, well, I want to play a guitar. No, you don't want to do that. And ended up playing the accordion, playing for seven years or so. And so, um, uh, I, 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 but I couldn't find, I didn't see that a black kid had a, uh, it had a real future at, except in Polish, <laughs> except in Polish and Italian weddings. And so I, I, I stopped that, and the Salvation Army uh, got that according. <laughs> uh, in, in your last uh, paragraph, did you mention <coughs> Calvin Hicks? I did, right there. Oh, oh Mr. Hicks. <laughs> yeah, he's not related to me. It's funny. They're not related, but they're as close as uh, they're as close of, to. I don't even as close to family is an odd way of saying it because they're better than that. Um, and so you know these people have, uh, have sustained me forever. You know they've been great, great friends. And it, it, like I say, friend is is a little too light. So, <laughs> so yeah. No? Oh, what, what are you thinking about doing in retirement? Well, you know, I've, I've kind of done that, and, and I'm doing it now. I've scared myself to death by, uh, uh, by quitting my comfortable job at a law firm, and uh, I, I keep my mediation practice going, but, I tried to, uh, but when everybody was running toward oil and gas, um, all the law firms were running toward oil and gas and kind of contorting their profile so that it would fit oil and gas. Um, I said there's got to be a different way to do this because as a litigation lawyer, I'm a trial lawyer, and so unless people have the, have the courtesy to get sued in the jurisdiction, you know, I'm always part of the dog and pony show, and may even lead the dog and pony show, but unless, you, but unless the, the company has the courtesy to get sued in your jurisdiction, you don't get any work out of it. So I thought that if I could take over, this, that I could replicate the business of a, um, of one of my former clients who had an environmental consulting business. And we tried to do that, and it was, we combined that with an ailing and aging uh, civil engineering company and thought that we might be able to do some things and you know, kind of fit into the oil and gas industry. And um, as, 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 so I, I talked to all these companies, tried to make sure that they were willing to use us, that they would see us as a viable alternative and all that. 
and um, I had it all ready to go. And um, I was a little bit late for my going away party at Spillman, at Spillman Thomas and Battle, where I worked. Uh, and I told them that was because I was kissing my last regular paycheck goodbye. <laughs> and so, but I, I started that, and as soon as, as soon as we did that, I mean, really, the moment I left, the oil and gas industry went into a coma. And uh, so it, it didn't work quite the way I, way I wanted it to, but we're doing some other things. And I have LRB Environmental and Technical, LRB Enterprises, and what, it, it's a combination of my name, my brother's name, and my brother's names, L, E, L, E, R, Eric, and B for Brian. And um, we always teased that we might use that if we ever went into business together, but I just stole it and took it for myself. And so uh, that's, what, that's what we're doing. We're moving toward construction. We're, I've joined with some people, and we're going to do some uh, construction projects trying to shore up the, the hillsides and the roads that, the, um, uh, that Governor Justice is talking about. So that's, that's retirement. Mel. Have you ever given any thought to political activity? Yeah, I did. Running for office? Yeah, I did. I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, and, 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 and Mel, I'm sorry, I'm, you're going to be next, okay? But no, well, um, you know, it, it's, it's funny how, uh, how a career shapes up. I mean, I, uh, with my kids in college now, I uh, try to comfort them that, you know, the, per the thing you major in is not necessarily what you end up doing. And uh, so many of us have uh, majored in one thing and ended up doing something completely different. And I just didn't, the, the politics, I didn't like the, the, the lack of privacy and all that, but um, I was appointed by uh, Governor Underwood, I guess, to the Higher Education Policy Commission, which is kind of like the Board of Regents in the, in the prior incarnation. And I saw something there that, um, this, it was this bright shining light that made, uh, that I said, this, is what I was supposed to do. After I came off of that, when Hazel Carter was ready to leave his position as uh, president of West Virginia State, I, I thought this is what I was supposed to do. And so I, I spent a lot of time preparing myself for that. I gave myself a homeschool PhD in higher education and um, by reading and talking with people and all that. But um, it came on the heels of some things that had happened up at WVU when they hired a lawyer for that, and it ha that lawyer happened to be one of my partners. And so it didn't work out very well when they did that, and um, the, the state was unwilling to look at somebody who was uh, uh, you know, local and, and a lawyer and practice, you know, particularly a trial lawyer. I mean, good grief. Um, you know, we just take, we're generalists. We take whatever anybody throws on our desk and, do, and try to do something with it. So, um, you know, while politics never hurt, had the appeal for me, that was the position that I thought that I was that I was simply supposed to do. They didn't think I was simply supposed to do it, and so it didn't happen. So um, you know, politics are not that interesting. Writing about politics are, is interesting to me. I still care deeply, but that's not. But you know, elected politics were not it. We got to get Mel because he's been raising his hand for quite some time. Mel, Mel, I'm going to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. I think you have kind of an interesting history, and I really appreciated you sharing it and having a long history with some of my family networks over a long time, watching some of that come together. Mm -hmm. And here we are today. I know you have two wonderful daughters mm -hmm. who in the next couple years could have a family. Could I? What would cause you to want to have them live in Charleston, West Virginia today and raise your grandchildren? Unfortunately, not much. I have, been, um, I have been a staunch advocate for Charleston. I love this place. I think this place gave me a tremendous background. Um, I love West Virginia. I'm very proud of, my, of, of being here. But I don't know why, but I've, I've given up the battle. Um, I don't know why I would ask my daughters to engage in the Sisyphean task of pushing that rock up the hill anymore. We have, um, you know, we have people who say that they are, um, uh, they'd like to see more business in West Virginia, and yet they want to try to stick with very backward themes that, will, that re are repulsive to people who want progress. And, um, you know, we see that this innocent ignorance that has allowed West Virginians to be used for such a long time in so many contexts, um, that innocent ignorance has now been twisted into something that's a lot more sinister. And it's, um, it's, it's, it, it, it grieves me to my heart to watch that happen. And I'm afraid, and, and I don't see that getting a whole lot better. I don't see leaders leading. I see leaders sticking their finger up to the wind and trying to figure out what, 
where the wind is blowing, I see no backbone. Um, it really, it angers me and it saddens me to see what we have allowed ourselves to become. And it's up to in the enablers of the people who would take us down the wrong path um, is very sad to me. So I don't know what we could do to, um, to turn that around. And I don't know that it would happen in the time that they are now ready to launch and do some other things. I don't know what I could say. And I don't know why I should say it to do anything to put any pressure on my kids to, uh, to stay anymore. And I hate to say that. I hate to say that. But you've got to say, you've got to be real, you know? Elliot said at the age that he is that he can't see himself being a young man. But uh, I like being called young myself. <laughs> and uh, as long as I'm next to him, <laughs> you know, you'll always be young. I'm <laughs> always be young. <laughs> and uh, as he has done for the past five years, our governor has been involved with our Lost Future series. <clears throat> and he has been really instrumental in putting together a certificate of appreciation for not only our program, but our speaker. Our speaker brings attention to our program and our organization. And we certainly want to thank you and appreciate what you did for us well, thank you, through this Lux Liquor Series. I appreciate it. Thank you. And also to my friend at K. Castle and Cheney, his friend from K. Castle and Cheney, John, would like to read this uh, Certificate of Appreciation to our friend, L.A. Dicks. Well, I'm gonna, and I'm going to do an introduction. Uh, Johnny McGee was, my, was one of my uh, uh, partners at K. Castle and Cheney. And, um, a, a, you know, dear friend. We, uh, he, he, he not, not didn't follow me immediately, but followed me as a state bar president and just finished his term not long ago as president of the West Virginia State Bar. So um, I'm, I'm more than honored. And I had no idea any, any of this was happening, so. <laughs> I'm just a spokesman. <laughs> but I will say that it's an honor to be your friend. It's a pleasure to read this proclamation. And I would footnote at a personal level, Elliot gave me my job at Kit Cast and Shane. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for hearing me. <laughs> So here's the proclamation, State of West Virginia, Jim Justice, Governor. Whereas Elliot G. Hicks is a native of Charleston's West Side and has practiced law in Charleston, West Virginia for 38 years, three years as a sole practitioner or in a small firm, and more than 30 years with several of West Virginia's most distinguished law firms. And whereas Elliot G. Hicks has taken over 100 jury trials to verdict in the state circuit courts and the federal district courts, and whereas L.A.G. Hicks was elected a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and is a member of the Federation of Defense and Corporate Counsel, and whereas L.A.G. Hicks opened LRB Enterprises, Inc., an engineering and environmental consulting company providing services to the energy sector and other traditional businesses in March of 2014, the company provides its engineering and consulting services under the name LRB Environmental and Technical. And whereas Elliot G. Hicks continues to work in the legal world with his solo mediation and arbitration practice under the name of Hicks Resolutions, and whereas Elliot G. Hicks attended Washington and Lee University and graduated from West Virginia University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science in 1978, and whereas Elliot G. Hicks graduated from West Virginia University College of Law with a Juris Doctorate degree and was admitted to practice law in West Virginia in 1981. And whereas Elliot G. Hicks served as president of the West Virginia State Bar from 1998 to 1999. He was the first lawyer of color to hold this position. And whereas Elliot G. Hicks currently serves as the chairman of Concord University Board of Governors, and whereas Elliot G. Hicks served as the chairman of the Board of Trustees at the First Baptist Church of Charleston, and later the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Charleston, and was awarded the 2019 Governor's MLK Living the Dream Award, and whereas Elliot G. Hicks is a caring and giving person, and his dedication and commitment to his uh, and career has been an outstanding example to us all. Now therefore I, Jim Justice, Governor of the great state of West Virginia, do hereby bestow upon Elliot G. Hicks 
this certificate of res recognition given under my hand in the great seal of the state of West Virginia, the 20th day of July, the year of our Lord, 2019. <laughs> Also, someone who's involved in our organization or our community activities outreach is a restaurant on the west side, which you all are good work at the two brothers in the grill. Mm -hmm. They serve an outstanding food. Mm -hmm. Over on five corners, them two brothers in the grill. You got a certificate for some ribs. Yes. You got a certificate for some ribs. Not bad. Oh, nice. Well, all right. Well, this has value, you know. Thanks. He's going to kill you. That's good. That's good. All right. I want to thank you for coming out. Uh, yes. You finished up the guy. Yes. I want to thank you again for coming out. Uh, two. Board members of my organization are here today, Ms. Clary Carter, Ms. Close, and Mr. Richard Wolf, and Ms. Deidre Key Switzer, Racial Justice Director at the YWCA. Uh, thank you all for supporting the organization, being a part of it, and helping us do good things with our community, our, our community affairs. We are a nonprofit, 501c3 organization, and we do accept donations from our community, our friends, and businesses. So if you know someone or would like to yourself make a donation to our organization, please do so. Uh, we would really appreciate it for our upcoming programs and projects that we're planning for next year. And again, thank you for coming out, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in September.
to the block, yeah. Some of y'all were. 